Okay, I make it seven o'clock. So I'm going to start off by welcoming you all to our 1st of February 2021 Our Jam. And we, we run one of these every month. They're usually on the first Monday. Occasionally they're not. So, for example, in April, the first Monday is Easter Monday. So we're going to plan to go on the 12th. But today is the 1st of February. Every month we take a theme. This month the theme is space. So in a couple of moments we will have for you, I think it's eight presentations, possibly nine if I've miscounted tonight, all on the theme of space. And um, we, we suggest that each person aims to talk for about five minutes or so, but they do have a 10 minute window and people we can see we've got lots of people live on youtube we're a bit nervous tonight it's the very first time that we've done a live stream to youtube we normally keep things tightened down a little bit more so please uh jen and dave and all the others and andrea keep typing in the chat now once we've finished our presentations we've got a, we've got a big one we've got a new person joining us tonight we've got a few new faces but at the very end we've got John Chinner he's going to be talking to us about robots that it uh, might explore planetary surfaces and all terrain and things like that after that we will then head into our jam jar and when we go into our jam jar we invite people to come and join us and we go into little separate rooms and we can talk to some of our presenters from this evening um, if you are tweeting anything, please use that hashtag RJAM. Uh, you'll see there's lots of links on the screen. Some of that will disappear. So you might want to, I don't know, grab some of it. You've probably seen it on the event page already. So in the next minute or so, we're going to have Spencer presenting. Uh, Spencer was here last month and he asked, could he present over two months? So this is going to be part two. Um, after this evening, all of the plan is that all of these recordings will be left available on our YouTube channel. You can come back and watch these using the same link. And if time allows, we should be able to go back and find some of the recordings from previous jams. And we've done quite a few. We've been doing this for oh, a few years now. Spencer, are you um, are you ready now to maybe make an early start? Um, I am, although share a screen. Yep. there's Andy and Eva before me. Oh, that's right. I should read the programme, you know, shouldn't I? <laughs> that was subtle, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. I think the mistake I'd made is I've, I can see lots of people's videos and Spencer was at the top. So, sorry yeah, about that. So, Andy, Eva, are you ready to take over? You want to something to share? Yeah, I'm going to do the screen share. Eva's yeah. going to uh, do the first half of the talk and then I'm going to take over. So I can't screen share at the moment. You have to let right. me screen share. Okay. You should be able to share now, yeah? Yeah. Okay. And that's my talk coming up now. And hopefully you should see that. And Eva, if you want to go ahead. So Tim Peake took two Astro Pi computers to the International Space Station in 2015. An Astro Pi as a Raspberry Pi seen on the left with a sensor board called the Sense Hat as seen on the right. The Sense Hat goes on the top of the Raspberry Pi. Mission Zero is for individual teams of up to four children aged up to and including 14 years old. It is suitable for beginners with no coding experience. It uses an online emulator and submission, so you don't need any hardware. You display a message and humidity readings to astronauts. Your Python code runs for 30 seconds on the International Space Station in May. You get a certificate in June showing where and when your code was run. On the left is my Python code, which I wrote and submitted. The emulator is on the right and shows my alien character. The emulator lets you move the Astro Pi and change the temperature in the air pressure and humidity readings. My code will run here. 
Here are two astropies attached to the side of the International Space Station. Thank you for listening. And now I'll take and now Andy will take over. So that was Mission Zero. Mission Space Lab is a little bit harder. It's for teams of two to six, aged up to 19 years old. The start date for the next one will be September 2021. And the Essex DMETs are now learning Python. And we think it'll probably take that length of time for them to get up to speed. Um, any other girls want to join us on Zoom are welcome. Um, and you can also get a Bronze Crest Award for doing Mission Space Lab. There's two themes. First theme is life in space. You investigate life inside the Columbus module of the International Space Station. And the second one is life on Earth. You investigate life on the Earth's surface using the near infrared sensing camera. And both themes can use the other AstroPi sensors. So what sensors are on the AstroPi? There's a visible camera, it's a Raspberry Pi camera. You can't use it as a camera though, it has to be used as a sensor. The no IR camera is the near in infrared sensing camera and you can use it to look at things like photosynthesis from plants. And it's got a blue optical filter which goes over it. You've also got a temperature sensor, a gyroscope to measure rotation, a magnetometer, so that's like a compass to measure the Earth's magnetic fields and other magnetic fields within the ISS. An accelerometer to look at movement, maybe things like orbit reboosts or if another spaceship docks with the ISS, air pressure, so if they repressurize it, humidity, and you can detect crew presence as well. So the AstroPi Mission Space Lab process is to design an idea for your experiment, create a program for your experiment and test it on Earth, deploy the program to run in space, and analyze the data you get back from space to prepare your report. So we're doing some Zoom workshops. So half 10 Wednesday, the 17th of February, we're doing AstroPi Mission Zero, and even some of the other Essex DMETs are going to take part and help. And AstroPi Mission Space Lab, we're running activities learning Python Sundays 2 to 4 for girls 10 to 19. And then around August and September, those who want to enter um, will run some activities then, see if people want to take part. So the details for that are on southandtech.co.uk and we'll put them up on Twitter, South and RPI Jams. Uh, is that it, Andy? That's yeah. Yeah, we've got it. That's brilliant. And for those who don't know, Andy, you've been running this the South End Raspberry Jams for I'd say as long as we've been running jams in Preston must be like good for yeah, you. I years. think it's coming up to seven years for yeah. the first of March. And the, what, one of the great things that I've seen is every month when we've been running our jams online, we've had you and other visitors from South End and Essex have come along. Yeah, the Essex DMETs have been doing lots of talks and I've just seen Nadine's going to be coming along uh, a little bit later on doing her Christmas tree lights as well. So <laughs> we've, got, we've got two Essex DMETs doing talks today. They've been really great and they're helping run our raspberry jams and our activities. So Eva's one of the younger ones, so she's come along today. That's fantastic. So uh, keep coming, Andy. Keep recruiting young members to your jams and keep sending them up to our press, up to Preston for <laughs> us. Thank you. Right, we're, we're ahead. So we've just been down close to the East Coast, uh, the Southeast, and now we're heading somewhere to the West Midlands, to Solihull, I think it may be where Spencer's joining us from. Is that right? Good evening. Yes, hello from sunny Solihull and the West Midlands. Thank you for letting me come back for part two from January. Um, I am one of those makers who just can't stop making. I love making stuff, whether it was my Raspberry Pi powered 3D theatre lantern for school, for in the school theatre, whether it was my Raspberry Pi powered little MP3 streaming music player, but I love making. And at the heart of my making is what can I build with technology that will actually make things that I can use at home be fun and enjoyable. And I'm, I'm not a gamer by any sense of imagination, but I do love Euro Truck Simulator. I absolutely love American Truck Simulator, but I also like the tactile buttons of a dashboard and playing a real game. 
So about two years ago, I made a very simple human input device controller for American Truck Simulator. You press a few buttons, a few things happen in the game. And that was quite fun. But I really wanted it to give me some telemetry, how fast I'm going and what's happening in the game. So put a lot of projects together for January. January is a bleak month. So I thought, right, I'm going to make a Euro Truck Simulator dashboard. I'm just going to swap cameras. And the camera now is behind me pointing at my desk. And this is it. I love 3D printing, I love felt. And at the last month, we saw the Adafruit Clue, which is a little sensor board with a screen on it, which is now sat here. And inside the box is also a Raspberry Pi Zero W connected to the internet and also connected to the game behind. So I'm running a server on your truck simulator. That's been picked up by the Raspberry Pi and that's been used to display real-time data. And I love tactile fills. So, um, in the daytime, when I'm home doing my live um, lessons for school, this just is a clock on my desk. Yeah, there's a little button that makes the LEDs light up, because who doesn't like LEDs? But actually, once the students have gone home, back to their virtual houses, and I've turned off my team's lessons, I take it out of clock mode, and I pop it into game mode. And in game mode, it starts picking up the server from the, from the game. Now, basically, the Adafruit Clue is only running as a human input device. There's about 15 buttons on here, of which about 10 are connected to the Adafruit, and the rest of them are connected to the Raspberry Pi. So the job of the Adafruit Clue is to take the button presses here and just basically convert them into a USB keyboard that goes into the laptop. So I'll turn the engine on. That connects the ground for all the switches back to the Adafruit. Um, I can press a button here, and that's going to start my engine in the game. So the engine has just started in the game. Now, it's quite dark now, so I'm going to put the lights on. And in real time, the game also talks back to the um, Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to also get indicators on the control box of what's happening in the game. Now, this is a very cheap laptop, so it's not running at about 20 frames a second. It's going to be a bit laggy, but we'll give it a go. Oh, handbrake off. So a nice sort of physical button on here, and then we can start moving. Oh, it might start raining. So let's put some, let's put some wipers on. And the little white light tells me that wipers are on. Now I like cruise control, so let's turn cruise control on. So I can just whoa, worry about steering. Um, and in real time, I'm getting the speed coming back on the dashboard here. Now, I'm not a very good driver, so I'm gonna, oh, no, ah, oh, crash into the side. Hang on, oh, crashed over here as well. Like in any good car or um, truck, when you get the error reports, the game also picks up the error reports in the code and it comes over the telemetry information. And I should start getting some engine dashboard lights flashing. Oh, oh I'm taking that junction a little bit to, oh, missed it actually, missed the corner. So in real time, the server on the game is sending data back to the Raspberry Pi. Total build cost for this project is round about £40, maybe £50, including the LEDs, the Raspberry Pi, and the Adafruit. And this was a really great project because it's the first time, oops, I've crashed. This will start flashing a bit. The first time I was using um, JSON files and reading from them in Python. So not only was this educational, not only was it fun, it gave me a chance to explore some more um, Python with JSON. You might notice my box is covered in felt. I wanted that authentic dashboard look. I love felt. The little labels were printed on a website that did retro labels. And actually for a little project for January, this was quite a fun little activity. Um, learned quite a bit from it, particularly, um, there's about 60 jumper cables underneath the box there. And I learned this time, I'm just gonna swap the cameras back to me. I learned this time that um, keeping track of 60 cables is quite challenging. So I had a big project box with all my prototypes of all my um, 3D prints of the different parts of the case. And I kept a really good list of what buttons and what cables were connected to each pin on the Raspberry Pi and each pin on the Adafruit Clue. And this is my first Raspberry Pi project where I've got 40 jumper cables, one on every single pin on the Raspberry Pi. So I'm, I'm actually quite proud of that. And my top tip, um, if you want to get into making and into digital making, is make something fun. 
make something that serves a, a need of purpose in your own kind of life. For me, creating my, my dashboard controller for playing the game, it's just so fun. It's, it's really silly, but actually I learned so much from doing it and got a lovely product at the end that I can actually use. So if you want to get started with digital making, make something fun. Make something that's going to excite you, inspire you, and um, something that's going to be kind of really fun to use. I'm trying to watch the, the chat and I see lots of messages about cables and wires, which is um, really cool. I have blogged about it. I've written a full um, write-up and we'll send out the links a little bit later. Um, and yeah, just say, get into digital making. It's great fun. Find something you want to make and just have some passion with it. Thank you, Alan, for letting me show you this this month. I know it's not space themed, but I just really want to show it. Don't worry. We, we say every month, you know, the theme is whatever the theme is. So, so next month, it's March. We're calling it March of the Robots. And we do have some people who come every month and they just ignore the theme, which is fine. Spencer, if you were to come back next month to do part three, might just have developed a little bit further? Uh, no, projects for February. Every, every month I'm going to have a different project. And February, I'm doing something Star Trek themed. Star Trek. Oh, so well, actually, that would have been space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's we a Star Trek. Stick it in afterwards. Yeah. yeah. And in April, then you might want to plan ahead because April, the theme, it's how does your garden grow? So. Ooh. So maybe rather than you try and work on something from last month, you could work on something a month ahead. I'll tell you what, then. If you, if you publish a list for the whole year, I'll plan my monthly builds around the topics. Oh, yeah, there's a good idea. <laughs> um, Spencer, if we didn't have things like COVID and social distancing at the moment, and somebody was in the West Midlands, are there any, like, would there be live events or community things that people can yes. go to? Yes. Um, Birmingham Raspberry Jam, we, we, we love Birmingham Raspberry Jam, we were running those quite often. Um, I'm running quite a few things out of Birmingham, including 3D Meetup, which is the uh, UK's first 3D printing festival, which we've run two years now, and we would have run last year, and that comes from an arts centre in the heart of Birmingham. So Birmingham, West Midlands, we are really kind of out there, we've got a great community, there's lots of people doing lots of cool stuff in Birmingham. And also there's... Um... You'll know Tim. Tim is one of the people who organises, I think, it's, is it the second Monday, the third Monday of every month? Uh, make, a, make, in fact, Maker Monday was this evening, just now, before this. Ah, OK. So we clashed with them, Tim. And we were looking at dance today, dance and technology. OK. So that's another thing that's worth looking out for as well, Maker Monday, although it's, it's princip I think it's principally an adult, like, like 18 plus. Yeah, yeah. They, I think they meet in a pub somewhere we, we do we meet above a pub in the jewelry quarter which is amazing actually yeah. it's very family friendly i take my kids along so while we're chatting spencer scott can be getting ready he's, he's going to present next you asked me spencer if we would publish themes for the rest of the year do you have any particular themes yourself and i wonder if people who are watching and can chat as well can say certain themes like i know we've got genevieve here this evening watching the live stream i'm sure she could come up with some great ideas what well I, i'm passionate about wearables at the moment wearables is a big thing and maybe something involving fabric textiles and cloth as well maybe an arts craft textiles mm -hmm. one Flex, what about, would it be, because, you know, people talk about resistant materials, you mm -hmm. can have what are called compliant materials, things that you can flex and bend, and I'm just, I'm just wondering whether those might be good themes, so, so wearables, I've just posted that in the chat. Okay, so thank you very much, Spencer. Spencer, tonight, are you about to join us for the gem jar later uh, yes, on? Yes, I'm just going to be planning my lessons for tomorrow, but I'll be there as well. <laughs> okay, we can watch you live planning. <laughs> Scott, are you, Scott Young, are we ready yeah, there, Scott? Cool. Okay, so Scott, are you ready to, do you need to share something? Yeah, I'm just sharing something now. Okay. Here we go. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yep, we can see your screen. Do you want to turn on your camera, Scott? I think my camera is turned on. Okay. It looks like your camera is off at the moment. Give me two seconds. I have a little message I can say that says, ask to start video. I can send that message to you. <laughs> See if that helps. Um, for people who are watching on the live stream, you may not know, but pretty much every month since we've been in the very first lockdown back in March, Scott has joined us. Now, 
a, a lot of our community are based in Preston. I could see Ivan getting lined up to present in a little while. And Ivan is one of those people who, who joins us from Preston. But Scott, Scott, I don't know that Scott has ever physically been to any of our jams in Preston. Because I haven't. Yeah. I mean, it probably would only take, I don't know, three or four hours on a train to get there and, and, and back. <laughs> I know, I know, but the thing is, my wife's from Adlington, or well, my mum and dad are still oh. based. So, you know, I mean, that's just around the corner. It's not too so, far. Yeah. No, it's not that unrealistic once we're back up and running again. I, I know Josh, who, who is one of our Preston, Josh keeps saying, when are we going to be doing physical jams again? And uh, I'm sure he'll be trying to persuade you to come down and join us. All right, Scott, you had your screen share on before. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just get it back up again. Uh, I think yes. your device will only do one or the other. It's either going to do the camera oh, or the screen okay. share. Okay. Okay, so space data. So like Spencer, I'm a, I'm a maker. I'm a habitual maker and I love making stuff. But this week, um, I'm not presenting anything that I've actually made, although I do have some code to show later on. But this is more to make people aware of um, some of the great resources that are out there. So I've been obsessed with space since as long as I can remember, but, you know, probably since it was about seven or something like that. And back when I was seven, you know, your only chances of getting something in space would be Sky at Night or the case old documentary on the TV or something. But now with the internet, things have gone fantastic. So this is a talk about space data. Now, what do I mean by space data? So with some of my previous makes, one of the things I've done is gone and looked for publicly available data and used that in projects. And one of, the, one of the major space agencies, obviously NASA, have made whole sets of data available to the public to use in their projects and stuff like that. So um, there's a link here. And um, I've also, at the end of this thing, I've got a link to my, my GitHub site and I've got some example code in there. So we can, we'll talk about the code later on. That's all up on the GitHub site. But there's a link there, um, api.nasa.gov. Um, and from there, you can browse all the available data and data types. What you can do on the NASA site is sign up to get an API key. So an API key is just something that authorizes you as a user. If you don't have that key, you can only get, I think, about 10 retrieves of the data. If you get the API key, you can get as many data as you want. Totally free. All you have to do is supply your email address. And the other brilliant thing that NASA have done, and I thank them so much for doing this, is that they've given examples of code that they can use for, for the APIs. And I say they are at least some of the APIs, because I haven't tried them all. But for some of the code that I've got later on, um, I've just totally nicked what NASA have done and used that in my code. So, I mean, what's on there? So, astronomy picture of the day. So every day they publish a new sort of astronomy picture. And if we go back, just a couple there. So in the title slide, that was yesterday's picture. Um, well, so they got Near, object, near Earth Object Web Service. You can basically track asteroids that are coming near to Earth um, and use that as, as kind of data. Um, the EPIC API, some lovely photos of Earth from the Earth Polychromatic Imaging Camera. They've also done quite a good job of getting acronyms in there as well, so it's pretty good. Um, Mars Rover photos, so photos of what's coming on the Mars, um, what the Mars Rover is sending back from its mission. Um, and then the brilliantly named Database of Notifications, Knowledge and Information, or Donkey, <laughs> which is full of space weather data. So things like um, solar flares, um, eclipses, all that kind of stuff is on there. So this is, the, this is just a couple of examples of what you can do. So this is the astronomy picture of the day one. And I'm not really going to sit and talk through this code, but as I say, the code's available on my GitHub site. But this is just kind of to show, I mean, again, to think back to the seven-year-old me that was obsessed with space. If I thought that when I was 45, I could be sitting there at home downloading images from space and downloading space data, that would have seemed amazing. <laughs> but that's where we are today. So, I mean, not a lot of code here. This is Python. Um, but between, you know, sort of about five blocks of code here, we can get this fantastic image. So, oh. Too excited there. So this is today's astronomy picture of the day. And as well, you don't just have to get today's one. So I've built a simple thing here just to uh, pull back the current day's picture.
but there's a whole bunch of stuff on there. And if you go back, you know, go back, you can go back years basically and look at all these pictures. So it's quite fantastic. And the other thing they do as well, alongside the picture, there's some um, API data. So Spencer mentioned JSON data. This is all JSON data that we're pulling through here. And then they've got a description of what your what the astronomy picture of the day. So this one is a halo around the moon caused by ice crystals. It's a pretty lovely picture. Um, and the next one I've put an example of is the Mars Weather Service API. And I've said there, yes, the actual weather on Mars. So um, about six months ago, I did an example on here of you know turning um, turn weather data into MIDI data and making weather the music. So my original plan for this was to use the Mars Weather Service, but it doesn't change frequently enough, only changes once every day. But, and I guess that's something else to think about as well is, you know, you can use this data for what it's intended for and to display things like Mars weather data or to display pictures, or you can take that data and turn it into anything else. So you can use it as random data sources, or, you know, you can try and turn the weather from Mars into music or into pictures or graphs or, you know, anything like that. Um, so yeah, Mars Weather Service. Um, the InSight Mars Lander takes continuous weather measurements on the surface of Mars at Elysium Planitia, a flat smooth plane near Mars equator. So what it's meant to do is take temperature, wind and pressure. Actually for the last couple of days all I've been able to get out of it is pressure. Um, an API, API provides per sol, so a sol is a Martian day, I found out yesterday, <laughs> and it gives you a summary data for each of the last available sols. And again, just some simple Python code. This is this is what gets returned. So this is the, the JSON data that, that Spencer was talking about. Obviously, that's not very readable. But what you can do is pull out, you know, you can figure out when the last fully available sol was. And you can pull out this. So this is each sol's or days um, information. It tells you things like the month, um, the season on the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. WD's wind direction, PRE's pressure. So you can get a bunch of readings from Mars. Um, and then I've just put a little example code down there that you can pull that out and just put it into a normal sentence. Or what you can do is pull that out and pull out some of the pictures from the Mars rover thing. And you could have a little thing sitting on your desk that was basically a Mars weather, <laughs> a Mars weather station, which is a pretty amazing thing. But NASA isn't the only place you can get stuff. So there's also a bunch of stuff from the European Space Agency. Now, I have to say, I had a look at this yesterday, and it's lots more technical type data there, and it's more sort of downloadable data sets. But again, you know, with something like Python, you can load those data sets in and start manipulating them and use them as you want. Um, European Space Agency site at the moment, anyway, is a lot less friendly and less API based. So it's not as, you know, it's not as simple as just going in. You have to download the stuff and re upload it into Python using maybe something like Pandas or something like that. And then one of the things that, that got me so excited about doing, I'm a Code Club lead. One of the things that got me really excited at Code Club when I first found it is this Code Club project. I think Ivan's going to talk about a space station tracker, but this is something similar on the Code Club page. So as a really good beginner's example of how to go and pull API and JSON data and pull that information at one of your projects, this is a great start. I'd highly recommend anyone that wants to get into this, give that one a go. And the last one is just, that's just a link to, that example code that I've got. So if you want to go and have a look at it, just go and look at it on that, that GitHub site. And that's me. Thank you, Scott. So um, Scott, if you just hang around for a moment, don't disappear. Um, there was a couple of questions that I want to ask you. We've got, we've got Ivan coming up in a few minutes, who's going to be discussing how you can use our Raspberry Pi to track the International Space Station. But just before he does, are you of a certain age, Scott, where you can remember space shuttles taking off? <laughs> yes. How old would you have been? Maybe 10 or 11 or something like that? Probably, probably, yes. But you're definitely not old enough to remember Apollo, the Apollo space program in your sort of lifetime as such. No, but so man landed on the moon on the 20th of July, 1969, which is six years before I was born to the day. So it's always it's always great on my birthday because you get all this stuff celebrating us reaching the moon. And I'm like, yes, yes, programs about space yeah. on my birthday. <laughs> so the reason I was asking because I think what I've been reflecting on today. Today there's been a, a spacewalk. I don't know if you've seen it's a, an EVA extravehicular activity from the International Space Station to astronauts, and they've been doing this. Um, replacement battery. They've been replacing the existing batteries from the, I think it's from the the 
PVAs, the solar generators, and they're putting new lithium ion. And of course, there was a batch uh, camera that had failed. So today they've been doing this and I was watching it. And, and I was wondering, this is where I was going with it, whether there are certain space expeditions and missions that people will associate with certain say decades or or or, or age generations and um john's joining us later on he's gonna be talking about exomars and i know that there are plans to have missions to mars in the next sort of within the next 10 years or so would you say you were rich which generation would you say a child of like the apollo the shuttle the international space yeah, station no. Definitely the shuttle, definitely the shuttle for me. Um, although now I am completely obsessed with the International Space Station. I just like, it's just mind blowing that there's humans living up in space at the moment. Um, and so I've got a daughter that's four and she's been watching, like she watched the last sort of change over on the International Space Station and they had a little baby Yoda on that as well. So now she thinks that baby Yoda's on the space station, like the real baby Yoda. It's not a toy that's up there. That's the real baby Yoda. So like I think all the three and like especially like I'm glad that someone talked about astral pie as well because I think astral pie is just this I think like we've done it with our code club for the last two years and like the code club kids don't get as excited about it as their parents when they come back and they you know you tell them what they've been doing today and they're like oh yeah we've we've sent code to space to do that and their dad's like, what? really <laughs> and they're like yeah yeah they're all blasé about it and I'm like yeah they sent code to space how amazing is that. <laughs> It does provide amazing opportunities because yeah. for, for most people like yourself and I, if we wanted to commission an experiment or something to take part, we, we'd have to have very deep pockets indeed. Yeah. But the idea that, you know, children can devise and conceptualize their own idea for an experiment to be run on the space station, it, it really is uh, quite amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Mind blowing. Um, have you noticed yourself whether there might be any parallels at the moment between how you're living in your home and what it might be to spend six months on the International Space Station? I'll tell you what, everything gets delivered. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't open the door either. <laughs> no, you don't use the same, you know, if you're having a, a shop in delivery, you don't use the same thing to get rid of all your waste as well at the same time and hope that it burns up on the way back to the uh, delivery centre, no? I'm just chucking out the window. <laughs> I'm not. He's ever watching. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the microgravity aside, because you probably haven't got one of those in your, in your house, but do you... Have, when you when you've been watching broadcasts from the international space station you thought gosh actually that's a little bit like you know when they have to take exercise within the the node two or whatever it is and they have to strap themselves down and stuff do you no i know well no but i never really i never really envisaged myself as staying in the one place for any extended period of time and especially not working from that same place, you know, and not really going anywhere apart from this one place. And now you, you, you do get a whole different sense of, I mean, they're in space, obviously, and it's not quite the same thing. I can go out for a walk outside if I want to without a spacesuit on. But yeah, it's quite, you know, it's quite confined quarters and you, know, you maybe get a little view of what it would be like. Yeah. So in, in some ways, you know, if you were, I, I feel like, oh, we're, oh, we've got a broadcast here. Scott's joining us and, and oh, and we're using the power of satellite communications to, you know, <laughs> we will go over to Ivan now in a moment, but there was one, just one funny thought occurred to me last night. I was getting the dog ready to take the dog out for a walk just around the block, nowhere exotic at sort of midnight or something. And it's sort of, where have I put my, oh, I have to go and get my shoes. Okay. And then, uh, okay, it's cold outside as well at the moment, but I, I, watching the astronauts this morning suiting up and getting all ready for their EVA, I started to think, Whereas, you know, see a year ago, you just go out of the house quite often without thinking about it, but now it feels like you are going on some kind of um, extravehicular expedition. Right, anyway. You don't bring your mask as if you don't have a helmet. You know, it's almost the same thing. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and coins. I cannot remember the last time I had coins now in my pocket. Ivan, knock, knock. Are you there, Ivan? Are you ready to... Because Ivan's going to tell us about how we can use a Raspberry Pi to track the... Is it the movement or the activities of the space station? 
Uh, yeah, it's the well, yeah, it's the current location of the the ISS. Great. So as soon as you're ready. Um, yeah. So stuff. so a, a while ago, I mean, quite a long time ago, um, I'd started looking at using um, e-paper displays. Uh, so I've got a couple of quite small ones. A, a primer only were doing um, some e-paper. Display. So I had a bit of a play with that and then looked at getting some, some larger ones. So I, I got, um, well, I managed to get a, a seven and a half inch uh, e-paper. It's actually, a, well, it's, it says it's HD. I mean, it, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, y y your normal screen, it's not really a HD, but it's, it's I think, uh, 800 an 80 by 528 pixels. Um, and it's, it's also, it's a, three, it's a three color display as well. So I'd, I'd been having a bit of a play with that and just thought, you know, what would be a good project to do with it? Because obviously the thing is with e-paper, um, once you display a, an image or information on the screen, it just stays there while, um, you know, even if you turn the power off, uh, it will stay there. Um, and it's really only useful for um, displays where you, you're going to do an update every so often. You're not, you know, it's not updating constantly, but yeah, perhaps every sort of two or three minutes. Um, so you, you wouldn't really want to update it more, more you know, much more often than that. I just thought, you know, a good one would be, um, you know, been interested in the ISS for, for quite a while and space for, well, for, for donkey's years. Um, so yeah, I thought uh, looking at the, um, the ISS tracker and then the, the, the Magpie magazine actually ran, uh, it's not, no, it's on the, it was on the blog, I think, um, blog, uh, on the, um, Pi foundation website, uh, July, I think it's July 2020, something like that. They they actually had uh, an example of someone who who run um, or, or set up an ISS tracker using same sort of setup really, but he, he was using a small 2.7 inch paper display. Um, but I thought, well, you know, it, it's the, the the concepts the same, so you know, it should be easy enough to do. So I took his code um, and and basically just modified it to. Um, to suit the larger display, so so that's this. It, it's running on a, a Raspberry Pi three A plus. Um, it will run on a Pi zero. It just it, it's just a bit slower updating on a Pi zero for some reason, um, but it runs really well on a, a Pi three A plus. So that's the Pi three A plus there running it, and the actual display. Um, show you the display. So so that's the. Yeah, so so basically, it it draws. Um, it, it's just three color, so it's it's red, black, and white. Um, it will uh, update. Well, it gets the position of the ISS every minute. Well, that's the way I've I've set up the code. So as I say, I adapted the code that um, this this guy had, had um, provided on, on his GitHub page. Uh, so I've updated it to do a few slightly different things. It updates every minute. Um, sorry, it gets a, a new position every minute, but does an update of the screen every five minutes, um, which which is you know is, is plenty, it, and and it, it gives it a decent track of you know where it's been. It also remembers the last three hundred and sixty positions that you've um, you've taken, and it uses a, an open API. So Scott was talking about getting data using an API. It's it's it basically it's the same thing. It just gets the data. It gets a, a latitude and longitude um, information from the API. I just then convert that to X, Y coordinates that sit over the map. Um, the other thing I found was that the uh, the the same um, web web well, the same um, domain is uh, a, an open API which will actually give you predicted pastimes as well. So um, it will if you give it a location. Uh, so you know, a location somewhere on, on planet Earth, it should uh, predict the next number of um, passes uh, that in theory should be visible from, from that location. So I, I actually managed to um, to put that in a little table at the bottom of the screen as well. So if I give you a sort of close up on that, 
And interestingly, we've literally just missed about the last, uh, so about eight minutes ago, there was actually a pass fairly close to us. So if, if you look um, there, you'll see it's just sort of passed um, about, yeah, it would have been about eight, eight ten minutes ago, um, past the southwest uh, of the UK. And, and the, the, the rings there just show where the, um, the location that I've specified is, is centred. So I've, I've just asked it to give me the next, you know, well, the next four uh, predicted passes for Preston. Um, so that's that's basically it. Uh, I, I think that's the that's the sort of main information. Um, yeah. Oh, I also put a little, um, yeah, obviously, because it's it's always useful to know when the screen was last updated. So I adapted the code just to give when the last update was on the screen. Um, the the latitude and longitude at that uh, at that point in time. So, so I made a few modifications to the original code. Oh, the the other thing was the original code. It, it actually plotted individual points, so it would have draw a little circle at each each point where it took the location. And I just thought it looked a bit nice. So just having the sort of straight line between. So I'm I'm taking the plots and and, and then draw. Oh, it's doing an update now. In fact, you can see it's it's doing a screen update at this point so it's always interesting to watch it takes about 10 seconds to do the update so it's just basically just pushing the ink around on the screen well, that's it so that's just yeah just on another update um well ivan i've got a couple of questions to ask um one of the first is it's prompted by a comment that Stephen amor has made in the chat on the live stream he's saying it's quite cloudy in cornwall have, have you considered whether there may be a way for you to feature in the, the I was going to say weather, but I suppose the main issue is the amount of cloud cover that there is and whether there could be some kind of a, a score yeah. that would rate the chance of being able to observe it? As, as it's that, you know, in, interestingly, that is one of the things I had thought about because, yeah, again, there are there's, there's plenty of uh, weather APIs which will give you that um, sort of information about, you know, percentage cloud co cover and stuff like that so so yeah i mean it, it would conceivably be um be possible to do that um yeah yeah so so the information as long as you can get the information from from somewhere from some sort of api it's then just a matter of changing the logic so yeah i mean that is actually interesting one of the things i had thought about um i mean the, the, the other thing would be you know it, it gives sort of the the predicted past times um, day or night, uh, and obviously during the day, uh, you, you probably spend a lot, you probably have a lot, lot less chance of actually seeing it. So, you know, I thought, you know, maybe just show the, uh, the, the predicted pastimes that are after um, sunset and before sunrise the next day. So, so there's, there's, there's different, yeah, different things it could, could be adapted to do, but um, I've only been working on it for a I don't know, a week or so, something like that, and you know, sort of coming up with other ideas. So I'm sure I will. So I wanted to ask, were you perhaps nudged in this direction by the fact that we had a space theme this month? No, no, no I hadn't just, seen oh, that. It was just, just it, it was just yeah. accidental. It's something <laughs> I've been working on, say, just probably a week or so. Yeah. I, I hadn't realised that you you were doing because uh, I didn't actually manage to get to the last jam. So, okay. Well, I don't know if you've seen yet on the chat, on the live stream on YouTube, but it's been quite a few people who are saying like, wow, what an innovative use of e-paper, because I think there was at one point a proliferation of these devices, yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. the, the books yeah. and that. And then as more affordable and better quality, faster updated uh, displays have come out, people have tended to, but you, what, what's a really nice thing is you're saying, look, you may have some of this old tech lying around that could be repurposed. Yeah, which is, yeah, which is brilliant. Could I could I just mention you were asking um, Scott a minute ago about sort of you know what what era in space generations you're going to tell generation. us generation. So no, it's just um, I don't know. It's it's probably not an interesting story, but it's, it is a, a story. So when I was at university in 1984, uh, um, so my final year at university, it, it was the first time that um, they'd done a. EVA from the space shuttle, and I, I don't know if anyone remembers. There's a guy called Bruce McCandless that, that did that that, uh, 
at EVA. Um, interesting. So I was at, at Reading University, and myself and a few of our friends, we went to the uh, the junior common room to watch the TV because we, we didn't have our own TVs in our rooms in, in those days, um, and we were just sort of sat there. And there was a, a guy sat couple of rows in front of us uh, never really thought anything more about it at the time um, but then a couple of days later actually uh, was told that the guy that was sat there was Bruce McCandless Jr so basically Bruce McCandless is, it's his son so so Bruce McCandless was doing the AV, EVA well uh, and, and I was sort of sat in the same room as his son which uh, that, that's an interesting story my wow. claim to fame a bit dubious but <laughs> anyway you didn't. You didn't ask him if he wants to go for a walk outside with you. <laughs> uh, he no, no, no. We were last out walking then. Yeah. Ivan, Those thank you very days. much. Have you had thank any you. ideas if you were going to come back next month when we're doing March of the Robots or April? How does uh, your garden not, grow? Yeah, possibly April. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Alan. So, thank you very much, Ivan. So. If you were looking at the schedule for this evening or the programme, it, it mentions that the next talk is led by somebody who uses the Twitter handle Techno Teacher, and it's myself on Meals in Microgravity. So what I'm going to do in a moment is I'm going to, I just want to share with you a project that I've been working on that's space related. Um, ideally, I could have done with 15 or 20 minutes off, but I'll try and make it fit into five. Um, and then following me, just so you so you can keep paced, uh, keep keep up, keep pace. That's it. So you can keep pace of our space themed event tonight. Following me, we have <laughs> the blob and um, uh, the Gary will be presenting the blob to us. So it's a bit of a mystery. We we try to figure out what it is, and he's not going to tell us until it's time. And then following Gary's The Blob presentation, we have Stephen Amor, who was joining us from, we could say sunny Cornwall, but we're reliably informed it's cloudy down there at the moment. And then um, one of the things I'm really looking forward to later on, uh, hearing from John Chinner, who had so, at one point arrested my attention with uh, something, a project he'd been building in his garden that links to the International Space Station in a certain way. So don't disappear, Ivan, because you might, and, and I haven't managed to find out yet whether John is joining us for the Jam Jar discussions later on. And for those people who are on YouTube and you don't really know what, what this Jam Jar thing is, well, there's a few of us that first started this Preston Raspberry Jam, and one of them's called Martin, and Martin is kind of lurking about in the shadows at the moment, making sure that the room is kept tidy and all of those kind of things right now this moment but martin came up with this idea that we would sometimes we get thirsty at a raspberry jam and, and it, there was a building next door to the raspberry jam venue in preston where we could go in and we could get large glasses of water some people drink small glasses of water and they sold crisps and we used to go there afterwards and we'd have a good old chat about what happened at the jam and one of the things that's that we're missing at the moment is when we do these on live online streaming zooms and all that we we're, we're missing the kind of informal chat so please later on uh, once john chinner has finished we're going to open up our jam jar but you will need to join us on zoom so if you're sat there in your lounge on your living room watching this in your smart tv i don't know if you'll be able to join us but we will share a link in a little while where you can come and join us there and we'll let you in and there's like breakout rooms now i want to share with you a project that i'm working on at the moment and then following me we have gary so uh, you may know I, I i i've taught for about 20 years or more in high schools and um in fact let me just share my screen because i uh, this this something I want to put on my screen. Yeah, this will this will work well. So, um, so what will happen is in a moment you'll be able to see. I think my browser. Yep, yeah, which has got a picture of me frozen still in a video. So explain a bit. So, um, while I was teaching in schools, one of the things I used to look forward to was planning school trips. So we, from the school I was at, we would go sometimes to amusement parks. Like there's a thing near us that that's not open anymore called Camelot, and it was all like. Arthurian themed rides. 
and sometimes we would go further afield to like the Science Museum in Manchester. And I don't know if you know this, but there's a reconstruction there of the very first stored program computer, the Manchester baby. And there was other places. And, and at one point I had planned to take uh, a school trip to Bletchley, to Milton Keynes, to visit the National Museum of Computing and Bletchley Park itself. But um, it didn't quite work out that way. However, I do now manage to take schools there on virtual trips. Now, I've had lots of teachers getting in touch and asking, could I do some virtual online trips at the moment that would have a space theme? And it just so happens that this month our Raspberry Jam has got a space theme. So I was gonna tell you a little bit about what I'm working on at the moment, and then you can have a look. It is a work in progress. So. Um, I don't know if you have noticed, but there are lots of virtual tours from the International Space Station that have been shared online where uh, various astronauts have gone round, sometimes in pairs, with a camera that faces either one way or the other. And they, they just show a little bit about what it's like to live and work on board the International Space Station. And because this is now a virtual trip that we're planning for a school. So there is this, an actual school who've asked me to plan this for them. Because it's a virtual trip and not a real physical trip, I thought, where could we go that we would never be able to go on a virtual trip? And that's where the International Space Station occurred to me. Um, maybe perhaps somebody might in the future, somebody younger than me might make it out to space, but I don't imagine I'm going to be doing so in the next 20 or 30 years. Anyway, let's go back to what this is. So I've started creating a series of uh, mini tours. So because these are aimed for children sort of seven, eight to 11 years old, the plan is that each one will last about 15 minutes. And rather than me just tell people about the International Space Station um, or just play videos, it's meant to be like a blended interactive uh, combination. So the I'll, I'll share a link to this video and you can have a look at it afterwards. This is my embarrassing first version. I've since done about 10 more versions of the same thing. And in, and in a few days, I'll hopefully share the final version, which will be a bit more polished. Um, but I'll just start playing it just for a moment, just to give it like a little bit of an overview. So you'll hear some Hello. of the sound, perhaps. I'm Alan. So I start off with a bit of an introduction and some of the feedback was the introduction was a bit long. <laughs> but in the introduction, um, bearing in mind children may not understand what microgravity is or um, how you move around in a, in a weightless environment or, or with a lack of gravity. So I, I, it's asking the children, like, how would you move around? And I've asked them, to, like I said, like tonight when you get home and you're on your bed, lie on your bed and look up at the ceiling and imagine you are moving around. And so, so there's like a few little activities and this, there's obviously warnings in there. Like if there's somebody less than two meters away from you, make sure you're not about to bat them in the face with your hand or something like that. So, um, so that's the first part. So it's discussing the challenges. And then I asked the children to think about, well, when they do visit the International Space Station on our virtual tour, how are they going to move around? And then this is the point where... I wonder what noises um, you can hear. It's quite carefully. noisy on the International Space Station. So I'm going to ask you a question, which you may be able to answer. So people on YouTube now watching the live stream, I can tell you it's really, really, really noisy when you're on the International Space Station. You may only get a small taste of the noise here. But I'm gonna ask you, what do you think contributes to that noise? It's just like this noise in the background that must be really hard to sleep. Um, so I see that Genevieve has put some images in, in, the, in, this, in the YouTube. But my question is, what do you think might contribute to that noise? So I asked the children to consider this and I, and I say count them. And you might be able to count, put things into categories as to what contributes to the noise. So then here's the bit where I've tried to play a little bit of a clever move. I then try to make it look as though I'm communicating with the astronauts. So let's watch this for a moment. This is Steve, and I've got something like, Hi, Steve. Hello. Hello, Steve. Hey, what's up? Dog. That's what we normally do, right? And, and then the next bit, I say to Steve, come on, Steve, come out and show us some of your zero G moves. Show us how you move about. And, you know, and of course, he's, he's very willing because I've watched the video enough times now to know what he does next and where he puts his hand and, and, and that kind of thing. So Steve then takes us on a mini tour and then I turn back to the children and then I say, I'll answer the questions in a moment. I'll, I'll give you a response to the feedback I've received. 
So the other thing is then it's like, now I want you to imagine oh, you've just woken up in the morning and you're about to go and have breakfast. Would you sit down at a table? What might you eat? Um, might you have sriracha sauce on your breakfast? And a lot of children are like, no. Well, actually, that might not be such a silly suggestion. And, and why does Velcro and sellotape and things like that come in very, very useful when you're trying to eat your breakfast? And so it's just trying to get children to imagine some of those challenges. So I, I will post the link in a little while, but I've what I've done to try and be helpful to teachers and others who like to take children on these trips to the International Space Station, I've put in like a timeline so you can see if you want to skip all the preamble about trying to move around in zero G. Um, I, I do explain where the noises come from and what, 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 what constitutes and contributes to those. Um, and then there's the questions about what would you eat for breakfast? And what's very nice in the way I think it happens is that Steve, uh, the astronaut in, in, in the video, he then explains the answers to those. And there'll be, there's, this is uh, number one in a succession. So there'll also be, right, so you've had your breakfast. Um, it's probably time to go and practice some of your daily hygiene routine. So it's like, how do you wash in space? And we talk about dealing with waste and we go and visit the WHC, the waste hygiene compartment. And it's like, how do you use that if you're doing a number one or a number two? And I think that might appeal to viewers of a certain age, perhaps. And then we look at some of the other things like working in space and entertainment and that. So I will put a link in a little while into the YouTube so you can see what that is. But now it's time for Gary to tell us all about the blob. So I will stop sharing. Are you there, Gary? Have you, have you got the blob ready to show I, us? I have indeed got the blob ready, yes. Um, okay. So if you're ready for me, I'm ready to start. Uh, if I could just answer the questions, it's fans, which are the, the air circulation system on the space station has to filter out things like dust and hair and moisture. The second thing is, is all the computers and the equipment, which generate quite a lot of noise, the power generators. And the third thing is there's a lot of people talking as well. Okay, Gary, enough of people talking. Over Thanks. to you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I'm just gonna do a screen share here. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to see uh, what I can see. Um, and uh, this is the blob. Uh, I've taken an interest recently in um, a, well, in slime moulds, basically. Uh, why you might ask? Well, scientists for some time now have been telling us that slime moulds show a certain amount of intelligence. So I thought, well, this looks interesting. Let's look into it a bit more, uh, in a bit more detail. So there's a, a slime mould there. That's what they look like in the wild. And that one's growing on a log. And uh, what you can see here is a kind of yellow mass down at the bottom right-hand corner. And then these kind of tubes coming out from it. Now, slime moulds are a living organism um, and they look a bit like a fungus, but they're not actually a fungus. They're an entirely different type of life form. Um, they're not animals and they're not plants either. Um, they belong to a group called um, protists. And what separates them from uh, fungi most of all is the fact that they move around and they can move at up to five centimetres an hour, which is not particularly fast in our terms, but pretty fast in terms of um, things in the fungal world. Um, so you could shift the length of that log probably inside of 24 hours. Um, why do they move so quickly? Um, well, they're always on the search for food, just like us. Um, now you might be asking yourself, well, what's, that, what's that got to do with space? Um, well, the, um, there was an exhibition recently in France um, of these slime moulds because they are so interesting to people and they um, have been for some time now um, there's been a call for um, more information about them. So they put this in this uh, exhibition on, and they called it Le Blob, uh, which was in tribute to the film The Blob from 1958, which is all about an alien entity that comes to Earth and starts hunting for food and absorbing it. Um, and um, pretty much as this, uh, this slime mold does, except in the case of the one in the film, it was uh, people that it was having this food. Uh, in the case of the slime mold, though, um, it eats just basically dead matter that it finds on the woodland floor. So um, that's one in a, an agar dish. And the mass that you can see in the middle there is the um, main part of the organism itself. And the way that it hunts for food is it puts out these arms or pseudopodia, as they're sometimes called, and it just basically sends out all these fine little filaments um, at random 
until it touches up against some food. And you can see on here, there's some uh, little flakes here. These are oat flakes. For some reason, these things seem to like um, porridge oats. And uh, once it makes contact with the food, it then shuts down all of the nearby little fibers that didn't make contact with this and starts pumping nutrients along um, just one thread along one arm. So it, it basically it has identified the shortest path between itself and the food, which if you look at it superficially, you could argue is a sign of uh, a kind of intelligence. At least this is what the scientists tell us. So typically um, it will choose the shortest route. It appears to be making intelligent decisions, but it doesn't have a brain and it doesn't have a nervous system. But you can put it to work. So, for instance, here um, there's a maze where someone has placed the um, the slime mold at one end of the maze and they put some food at the other end of the maze and then let the slime mold mold just spread itself throughout the maze until it finds the food. Once it's made contact with the food, it then shuts down all the routes that um, are too long and keeps the shortest route and pumps the nutrients back to the main um, body of the organism. So effectively, it has solved the maze. And this is a relatively simple one, but there's no reason why it could be you know, extremely complicated. And it's also been found that you can use this slime mold to do other things as well. For, so, for example, you can get it to design efficient transport networks. Um, it will even beat casino slot machines. So uh, here's an example of a network where what the scientists did was they put some blobs of food onto a plate and they distributed the blobs in the same pattern as the Tokyo Rail Network and then set the slime mold to work and it crawled across the plate, joined up the uh, various um, blobs of food there and optimized the distances between them and ended up effectively designing the rail system for Tokyo. So what had taken engineers several decades to produce and um, the slime mold was able to do in a matter of a few hours. So I thought, well, this looks rather interesting. I wouldn't mind getting hold of some of this stuff myself. Then I thought, well, actually, since the slime mold behaves in a fairly um, well-defined way, in a fairly simple way, why not write a computer program to do the job? So basically, the algorithm is the, the, the Fisarum puts out multiple arms until it uh, touches food, and then it just strengthens the shortest path um, that it finds between it and the food. So I thought, well, that should be easy enough to program. So why not use a nice, simple programming language like Scratch? So um, I've created this program where we have a, um, a blob of, uh, which puts out multiple arms until it touches food. And then after a while, it'll then display the shortest arm that it's produced. So it behaves in the same way. Um, so I'll demonstrate that to you now. There's a link here, which I'll show you again at the end. You can go on to that yourself. It's my own um, Scratch account. I only set this, this up this morning. Um, it's got this one project on it, but you can have a play around with it for yourself. So we just click on there now, open that up. OK, so um, we're in and if I just um, make it full size. Now, uh, just excuse me, I'm just going to right, that's better. OK, so the way it works, is I click on this green flag now, the blob starts to put out an arm and it's going to be quite a long arm initially because, it's, well, actually, that wasn't so bad. It's relatively short. It would it could be up to a thousand steps long, but it managed to do it in one hundred and thirty eight steps, as you can see from the top right hand corner there. After four runs, it's managed to get down to just 77 steps. Don't forget what this thing is doing is it's just simply putting stuff out at random. It's got no intent uh, behind it at all. It's got, it can't, it's got, you can't see the food blob from where it is, um, but it gets quicker at doing this as it, go along, it goes along because each time it makes a new connection, um, it knows that in this instance, um, it only took 74 steps to get from where it is to the food blob. And therefore, it doesn't need to travel any more than 74 steps or now 45 steps to actually get to it in the future. So in quite a short time, it goes from what is almost an infinity of choices down to um, very few steps in order to be able to actually get to the food that it's looking for. And this particular layout is normally around about 19 um, steps, which actually optimise its length. But I'm not going to wait for it to do that because it could take a while before it uh, discovers the, the 19 steps one of the 19 step routes because there's several of them so i was all right down to 22 not bad so i'll stop that there if i now press um, p on my um, keyboard that's the playback button so it'll play back its greatest success which was the um 
the 22 steps. So what we've got here then, I'll just go back to my uh, presentation, um, is something which can go from a uh, long um, path to a very short path in a relatively short amount of time. In this particular instance I'm showing you on here, there were 73 runs before it finally got around to um, giving us the pretty much the optimal length. So is this really artificial intelligence? Well, you know, to talk about that amongst yourselves later on in the uh, in the chat rooms. But certainly uh, when I put the blob inside of a maze, which um, you can see on here, uh, it didn't take very many runs before it managed to find an optimal route. Now it's been bouncing around a bit, but it's got from where I put it in the bottom left-hand corner there to the exit. It's avoided all the traps that I set for it. So it's not gone off one of these side areas here, um, basically because it's visited all of those and realized that they're dead ends. Um, and so it's working its way very quickly now towards having a single pathway through that maze. So yes, it can forage, it can find the shortest path through mazes, just like a real live um, slime mold. Um, it isn't copying the slime mold exactly, and this program isn't an actual simulation. It's more of what I call a mimic um, of the uh, behavior, but it still embodies the same principles. It's showing seemingly intelligent behavior. It's only using blind random movements until it touches some food, and then it identifies the shortest route. Um, why did I bother with this, or why should anybody? Well, you've got an AI here without any of the complex math that's normally associated with it. It's, the algorithm is dead easy to understand and modify. It's just basically generate some random directions and compare to path lengths, the, the re most recent path length and the shortest one that you've traveled. It's a play-based approach, so you don't get bogged down in theory. You just play around with this thing. Loads of scope for ex experimentation and, and development. And of course, you could gradually build it into a more sophisticated um, AI over time. So if you want to have a play with it yourself, there's the link. Enjoy. That is fantastic, Gary. Um, I have also shared the link on YouTube. So okay, great. Um, although I disabled link sharing earlier, <laughs> it, it, I have shared that on there. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I'm going to move, because I'm much keeping on the time. I overran a little bit earlier. I'm going to move on to see if John is ready for his presentation. Um, but he's not joined us yet in the main room. So, um, John, do you want? I can I can pull him in and see if that works. Gary, do you think the blob would be smart enough to deal with the traveling salesman problem? Um, hang on a minute. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Right, I can't. I can't see myself, but I can hear me. So, I, I, yeah, if you, if you can hear me, that's fine. Uh, yes, basically, it could. In fact, it can do. Potentially, it could do much more sophisticated stuff than we've got going on here. I mean, I actually ran it through a copy of the uh, Hampton Court maze the other day, which is a fairly um, well-known um, maze that people like to travel around from time to time. And it can deal with that just as happily as you know, a much more simple one. And it, in fact, you could give it stuff. The reason why you couldn't give it, say, a maze with a thousand um, alleyways in it, it would eventually uh, work its way through. And... Basically, I was thinking about this afternoon, any problem where you have choices which require you to basically make the best choice out of several options, theoretically, this could do it. So, you know, you could get it to, uh, all you need to do is formulate your problems in that way and hand them over to it and it should be able to solve it. So, uh, they, I mean, I mentioned the, the one-armed bandits um, on the casinos before. Um, there's a famous um sets of problems known as the the multi-armed bandit problem where you imagine you've got a row of, of one-armed bandit machines and you have to optimize the use of them by pulling the levers in the right order until you make the most money well this physerum can beat any human being <laughs> so you send it along to las vegas it can make you a fortune potentially um the only problem with a, a real live um, slime mold is that they're very slow, obviously, they're five centimetres an hour at best, but this computer generated one could zip through it. I mean, flat, the, 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 the scratch one was pretty quick, but if it was to write it in machine code, you could probably do millions of operations a second. And uh, yeah, try it. <laughs> well, I, I was just trying to do some calculations in my head. I mean, if how many. How many instances of slime would we need if we had an infinite number of typewriters and we wanted the blob to write Shakespeare? Yeah, well, the thing is, you see, you've got you've got to have an end in mind. You'd have to have a Shakespeare for it to uh, to compare with. 
um, which means you've already have to have written it in, in advance. So it'd be a bit of a pointless exercise in that particular instance. You're better off setting it problems where you know what outcome you want, um, but you don't know how to get there. Does this, <laughs> does this sound like a problem that the blob would be insulted because it's such a powerful, intelligent brain and that you're only you're insulting it by asking it to write? Well, well, this, this version I've shown you today uh, probably won't take umbrage at what you have to say about it, but you never know at some point in the future. Could happen. <laughs> Do you think that um, this, the, the blob will gain and grow in intelligence given, uh, uh, you know, an adequate well, amount uh, of time? Well, again, that, that, this was another idea I was thinking of this afternoon. If, if, if I was to write a version of it um, which could get out there and crawl on the um, across the internet, then yeah, uh, there's no reason why not. It's because the slime mold itself, of course, its intelligence is the product of a long. Um, period of, of evolution selection by uh, you know natural selection uh there's no reason why we couldn't build some natural selection rules into this thing so that it will but zip through them <laughs> like a billion times faster and yeah it could come up with a pretty powerful intelligence in probably not too much time at all for those of you who know or have heard about the singularity this might be the start <laughs> now um we we have a, a talk which is scheduled for a quarter past eight and John, who is going to be giving our talk at that point, he sent me a message earlier saying he was having some technical issues. Um, so what I'm going to suggest that we do is, oh, yeah. oh, John's here. Okay. John, are you happy to turn on your camera? Oh, no, I'm happy. Are you happy for me to yeah, turn the yes. on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's good. I don't have to put the plan C into place now. Oh, you've been joined by somebody behind you, I can see. Oh, somebody's face I recognise. Tim. That's, yep. Yeah. That's, that's flat Tim, my security guard. <laughs> Do you ever walk in there in the morning and it, it takes you by surprise because you'd forgotten he was there? No, no not me, but occasionally... You know, back before last year, when I when I go to visit schools, I take Tim with me, and occasionally it's left in the house in the doorway or behind a door somewhere. And my wife will come home, which will be <laughs> okay. So, um, so this may or may not be the last. Talk. We may have somebody else. We might have a surprise guest join us at the end. But John, I'm going to turn off my camera and Mike. You okay to share or talk or do whatever it is you need to do? You're gonna you're gonna tell us a little bit about why you're interested in space, some of yep. the projects that you're working on, and. I think some of the projects that you mentioned earlier today, I can see people watching thinking, well, I've never heard about this. How do I find out more? Yeah. OK, well, I'm happy to ad lib a little bit um, and then hopefully we've got enough time for some questions so you can really pinpoint in what exactly it is you, you want to hear from. But um, I'm going to start just by sharing my screen with you, if I can just pull up the first image. Go back to here, share screen, right. I updated my computer to Windows 10 yesterday, so it's starting to, um, right, hopefully you can see that on the screen. Um, that is a Zephyr 8 aeroplane, solar powered, um, petrol aeroplane essentially, solar powered, charges its batteries during the day, flies on the batteries overnight, stays above 70,000 feet. And that image there is taken in Yuma, Arizona, 2018 where we did a test shakedown flight and that aeroplane flew for 26 days continuously landed in almost perfect condition um, and could have carried on probably for months flying up in a stratosphere so if I just skip forward a little bit there's a for scale that's the size of the aeroplane hand launched by people now there's no there's no raspberry pi on that aeroplane but um, I was the avionics lead engineer on it and I had to shoehorn raspberry pi in there somewhere so um, the camera the forward-looking camera that a pilot uses to see um, uses a composite video and I dug up a really old Raspberry Pi I had with a composite output and used that to, to download some videos from YouTube of, of uh, clouds and stuff and pipe that straight into the, the um, radio system that would broadcast that image down to the pilot in the GCS. So I managed to shoehorn a Raspberry Pi into that project without sending up on the plane. Um, I'm hoping that at some point in the future people might be using Raspberry Pis in the, in the, in the payloads for these aeroplanes. Um, so some of the other things I've done is um, obviously Astro Pi. You probably all heard of Astro Pi. Someone was talking about it last uh, tonight. Um, I was involved with um, the Astro Pi One campaign, 
the Tim Peaks mission. This is, um, you probably recognize that guy, it's Dave Honus. Um, and on that, in that white bubble packaging on that table is, a, is an Astro Pi, that one of the ones that went up to the space with Tim Peak. And we're simulating a Soyuz launch there on the table. That's gonna, that table vibrated the Astro Pi um, in a simulated um, shock and vibration profile as per the Soyuz. Um, it was it was fantastic to do that testing and to be involved with uh, with Astro Pi and um, continuing on now with the the, um, the Mission Zero. I do quite a lot of Mission Zero submissions for, for young people who maybe aren't in the classroom environment, maybe one to one, one to two, so they get the opportunity to have a go at Astro Pi. And we also did some of the best photos I could find. I can't find any of the photos I took at the time, but you can just see on the bench behind us there, um, and in the apprentice's hand there is the uh, is the two that's the two flight units right there. So they're the ones that are on in the space station right now. Um, but right there, we're in an anechoic chamber. So we did the EMC testing on these uh, astrophysics as well. So we bombarded them with radio waves to see if they would survive the environment on the space station and also to check they weren't going to emit anything that was going to interfere with the space station. Um, that's a terrible photo, isn't it? There you go. So just skipping forward really quickly, though, my, my, my main love is, is space, obviously, as you mentioned, and, um, you know, Mars rovers particularly. Um, this me with Bruno. So I'm going to skip to try and play a video now, and I'm going to try and share that screen with you instead. Just make sure, John, when you click on the share, there's a option to include sound from the video. Right. I did try this in the breakout room earlier, so Good. fingers crossed. I'm going to play this and just leave it with you for a bit. Hoping you can hear this. We can hear, yeah. Good. Yeah, that's quite exciting, isn't it? I like video. That's that's an internal video with Airbus, but it's not in the in the public domain. But I like to show it. So I'm really lucky. I work for Airbus Defence and Space, who are the main integrator for that rover. Um, and it's quite exciting that we get the opportunity to take some of the um, prototype Mars rovers out and about, take them to school. So this is Bruno, as you can see in that video. So in the video on that sandy background, that was the Mars yard in Stevenage. It's a, it's a very large room full of sand used to test that drive the prototype. So we take them out. So here's, here's Bruno. You can see how big it is compared to me. Um, and you can see there on the front of Bruno, there's a, this bit here is the drill box. Now there's lots of Mars rovers on Mars. There's lots of missions to go to Mars, but ExoMars, the European Space Agency mission is the only one that's taking a two meter drill. So it's got this drill box on the front which will drill two meters into the surface. So about the height of the rover again. And, and really that's key because the surface of Mars being so harsh, 
um, anything that's probably organic or living is going to be below the surface deep enough that it's going to be protected from that radiation. So it's quite exciting to be able to take these things out and about and show them to school kids and talk about robots in space. Sometimes they break. Um, this is Bruno and had, had a broken wheel in the middle of a school exhibit, so we had to fix it. And that's really quite exciting to do things like that, to, to get on the floor and start playing with the Mars rover. Um, but here's me with this, uh, having a selfie with the flight. So this, I'm assuming you can see my mouse, this on the table in the middle of the room, that's the flight Exo Mars rover all stowed up in Stevenage before it was sent off to Toulouse for its final integration. So really, really excited to be able to get involved with things like Exo Mars. So the programme was, was delayed a little bit. It's going to launch in September this year and takes about, well, nearly two years to get to Mars. So we're looking at landing in 2023. Um, um, so, you know, we've got a bit of time to build up some excitement about this mission, this European Space Agency mission to go to Mars. So it's been around for a long time, though, this mission. So a while ago, I decided that I couldn't take Bruno to schools and because Bruno's so big, I decided to build a small rover that I could take to schools and show them what goes into a Mars rover. So naturally, being a, a Raspberry Pi nerd, I decided to build something Raspberry Pi inside it. Um, this is my youngest daughter, Daisy, helping me out, my little budding engineer on, the, on my mother-in-law's dining room table. Um, so here we have you know, a, a six-wheel drive, six-wheel steering rover that's quite small, can fit on a table, fit in the boot of your car, you can take it to a school um, and inspire young people about engineering and science. Um, and what I've been doing in lockdown is I had a, one of the people I've met on Twitter, um, Duncan Jauncey, write a GUI for me that could be, uh, that, that runs on the Pi, a little patchy server, and you can connect to a laptop and you can give it commands a bit like Scratch. You can drag and drop these commands here into this planning area and then hit execute and it will follow the commands like a big track would have done back in the day. And this is my garden. Um, <laughs> actually, in the background is where the cabin I'm sat in is now. But anyway, so I was able to set this up on Team Viewer and have people drive this rover remotely in my garden during lockdown from all over the world. I had people in um, Portland, Oregon. I had some people in Kenya drive this some young people you know this is young people that might not get access to these things and they were sending commands to this remotely over team viewer in my garden searching for things interesting stuff in the garden so i hid an alien i've hidden a little astronaut and i hid that model mars rover in there so it's quite cool to be able to do those things and give those opportunities to people um and going forward I, that that mars rover in that previous picture that's yuri so yuri's currently in 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 a in a bit of a stripped out mode at the moment. So you can see it's just a silver box with a head at the moment. I'm redoing the locomotion system on it. So I've got a fair, uh, fair amount of work left to do on that. But inside, it's just a Pi B plus. I've got loads of them, so that's what I use. I'm also upgrading it to have one of these bad boys in it, a red board. Um, these are fantastic little boards. But going forwards, if you really want to get involved with Mars rovers and you don't want to build something shiny and aluminium like that one, you can build an ExoMy rover, which is what's on the screen right now. Um, you might have seen it, but this is almost entirely 3D printed. Uh, it's open source. All the software's out there. All the models are out there for all the 3D printed parts. And you can go out and you can download the parts and you can build one of these little six-wheel drive, six-wheel steer rovers. And hopefully in the background, you can see my little ExoMy doing its thing. It's a, a rock candy remote. And I've just added in some Neo pixels for, oh, there you go, headlights. They're really, really, really bright. I need to turn them down a little bit. Um, so the idea is that's a model that's open and available for anybody to download the parts, put them at home. There's some really good instructions on how to put it together, how to, how to drop the code onto the Pi inside. And uh, there's a camera in the head there for streaming. So there's some really interesting stuff you can do that's quite accessible to people in schools to be able to build their own robots. And what's the easiest, fastest way for people to find this? Is Do they go on your Twitter uh, or well, is there a site you'd recommend? It's not me doing it. So if you Google yeah. XOMY, so E-X-O-M-Y, Rover, you'll find um, there's, a, there's a dedicated web page. This is ESA have funded this. So this is an ESA project. Um, Google ExoMy, and there is so much data out there on it. You know, all the files, you can literally download them and put them straight on your printer. Um, there's a Discord group as well. So, you know, if you wanted to, to do this and you wanted to join in with the Discord group, you can reach out to me on Twitter if you want, and I can add you into the Discord group um, because they want people to start building this thing up and start snagging any issues they have with the 3D printing and trying to help other people build it up. So um, 
it's really cool. That it's, it's it's a really simple little robot, but actually it's really capable. It's got it's similar to my big one. It's got six wheel drive, six wheel steering. It's got gimbal bogies on the wheels, and it's got a camera in the head. Um, it run this one runs ROS or ROS. Um, my my rover just runs ordinary Python. Um, and actually, my Exo my rover doesn't have their version of software on it. I've got one of my old Pies and another Redboard inside there because I know how to use it. So, um, you know, you can. If you've got access to a 3D printer, you can make one of these relatively easily and it assembles just using ordinary off the shelf screws. It's really, really straightforward. And that's the idea is it makes it accessible. So that's, that's ExoMai. Um, I just don't know to share the link to that in the chat on YouTube. Yeah. So, um, and there's my rover in the Magpie. Um, I don't know if you can see what edition that was, but if you wanted to find out more information about me or my rover, you can have a look back in the Magpie. I want to say 73 for some reason. Um, and the Magpie magazine, people can download that digitally for free. Yeah, so, if yeah, they, yeah. so if they download issue 73 and it's not, <laughs> they can tweet at John Chin and say, oh, yeah, if, and yeah, John, I mean, I've got, a, I've got yeah. a hard copy of it somewhere. I don't know what I've done with it. Um, going on. What's out there? And it's prompted me to remember a kit that I think. Uh, is it 82? Oh, 82. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a bit of a difference. <laughs> it's not an off by one error, that is it. Oh, it depends on how big one is. Um, June 2019 in there. Okay. Have you seen there is a kit that you can buy as well? Somebody's going to tell me the name, remind me. Gadgetoid leaps to mind, but I don't think that's the right. There's a an Yes, there's a rover kit that you can purchase if you have enough funds. Some there's a few out there on the market, actually. Yeah. There's the um, JPL made an open source rover version, um, and that uses the same. Is this the NASA JPL? Yeah, that's the NASA JPL. Okay. So after I built my rover and put it out there on the work for the world to see, NASA JPL decided to build one, and they use the same aluminium parts that I use in my locomotion system on their rover. Ah, four um, this is, this yeah. stuff is, is, is um, aluminium actobotics um, from the Servo City range. Um, really good stuff. It just literally bolts together. The whole pictures are all made to bolt together and you can make some really, really good assemblies out of aluminium um, really quickly, but it's not cheap. And the whole, the whole um, aluminium uh, locomotion system you can see on the rover on the screen there was about 600 pounds in, in aluminium parts, motors and things. So. Uh, it's not cheap, but you know, for me, it was a good investment because I've been, I've been to uh, maybe six hundred kids have had a drive of this rover over the years. I've been taking it to school, so you know, for me, that's that's absolutely worth it. Fantastic. So, uh, John, thank you very much for coming along and sharing some of your projects. Um, John's a very interesting person to follow on Twitter. I don't know if you already do that because John's always sharing photos. There was something you shared in your garden one day, and from memory, I thought it. Is, was it right? I think it was a way of downloading data from satellites. Yep, that's correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's weather, um, weather data. So it's other. It's called OtherNet. It's a little um, project that's been running along in the background for quite a while. It basically um, is a way of um, getting data to places that don't have internet capability, not for browsing and, and Amazoning and things like that, but just for data. So the idea is that you put. Um, it's a Pi based. Um, it was a Pi based. It's actually they got away from a Pi now. But originally, it was a Pi based um, receiver, and the Pi would set up a Wi-Fi network. And there was a little um, little receiver board that sits on top, and you point it at a satellite. And you know, using a dish, you don't even need a dish now. You can scoop a tiny little trickle of data comes over this satellite, and it's things. It's like open Wikipedia things and and, and general consumption books and stuff. Um, and it goes into the library on the Pi, and then the, that, those that data is accessible via Wi-Fi locally. So the, the vision is to put this thing in a school somewhere that doesn't have uh, the internet. And then they've got a library in that school, a digital library, and you can update the digital library via a satellite. And I'm trying at the moment to negotiate some bandwidth on some of our satellites to be able to provide them a bit more coverage. Because at the moment, the footprint coverage isn't great for places that don't have the internet. So it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a slow burner at the moment, but trying to get there that you can actually you know, bring that digital library to anywhere in the world and with this small um, receiver that potentially could be solar powered as well. John, do you think you'll be able to join some of our jam jar that's happening straight after you and I finish our conversation? Yeah, 
Yeah, because we had some complaints on the YouTube chat. People saying John was sharing his screen and we couldn't see his camera was so small and he was showing us these things. So if you are in the yeah, jam jar session, you, I think you're going to get you're going to get some questions from people. No, that's fine. I like I like questions because it gives an opportunity for people to to get the answers they want rather than me that's trying right. to transmit and, all the time. Yeah, exactly, and to interact and engage. Okay, so John, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you to John and all of our wonderful presenters this evening. Um, I'm now going to explain how the jam jar session will work. So this bit could get a bit complicated. I do have some information I've written down. I will post some of this in the chat. Basically, you just need a link and access to Zoom. If I post, first of all, the link to join, other people may share this as well. Um, so you won't be, I will shut down the live stream in a few moments once I have shared this information. So there's a link that I have posted in. So the jam jar are informal little breakout rooms that will happen. And I've created three breakout rooms, which will start in a short moment. And basically you can choose which room. It's almost like you're in one of those places where you can have drinks and you see, oh, there's something interesting on that table over there, so I'll go to that room. Oh, there's something interesting on that table over there, so I'll go to that other room. So um, that's what will happen. So, so people are already starting to join us and come in, but I need to give out some more information. So um, once you join, I suggest you choose one of the first two rooms that are there. We've got one that's called a space shuttle. We've got another one that is called, what are they called? The International Space Station. And they're probably gonna be the most popular rooms, but you know what, if we don't have enough space in those rooms, then people may want to go to our extra room, which is called Moon to Mars. So that's, uh, that's for much later on perhaps. So Simon is already in the International Space Station. I think he's in node three at the moment. So you might wanna head, um, I think it's aft, if depending on where you are, I suppose it's all relative. I'm not going to say up or down. We've got, oh, we've got um, John Chinner. Oh, John Chinner is on the bridge of the space shuttle at the moment. So you can go and meet him in there. And um, so as you join, you need to find the breakout tab and then you can go in there. So what's going to happen in a few moments? I'm going to say, people on YouTube, thank you. I will hang around for a few minutes um, and I will read. But basically, we want you to come and join us in the jam jar and you can go into rooms and you can chat in there. So um, got a few people coming in and joining us now. So I suggest as soon as you join, find a breakout room of your choice and then um, head over there. In and join us now. Okay. Um, thank you people for joining us in the chat on YouTube. Um, what we I will do shortly is I will close down the live stream um, and once you're in a room if you want to take a break you know if you need to go and refill your glass or something like that, that's fine hello look for the breakout room option and then choose one of the first two rooms to go and join yep so i'm going to hang around in this main room where People are coming in and joining me, but you need to really, you want to go and find the main room. So the space shuttle's getting quite busy. We could probably only really have a crew of about eight on there. And at the moment we've got four people on the space shuttle. We've got a couple in the International Space Station. I think Spencer's decided to go from moon to Mars. It could be a lonely, very long journey that Spencer. You could be in there for at least three years or something. So um, I hope you like space food. <laughs> Um, we still got lots of people joining us who haven't joined the breakout room yet. I might start throwing people into rooms. Do you know what? Space station, still plenty. So I'm going to send John McMullen over to the space station. Who else? Gary. Uh, we could put you on the space station, maybe, unless you choose something yourself. Okay, so um, thank you everybody for joining us on YouTube. I'm going to shut the stream down in about 10 seconds. The link that I shared before, I'll put all of that back in the chat, but you basically need to grab it quickly if you want. There's a link, which is exa is forward slash jam jar. Um, got, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I suggest you go and choose a space vehicle of your choice. 
So the space shuttle's getting quite crowded now. I think some people might want to go and join Spencer on his moon to Mars journey. He's going to be very lonely there on his own. Oh, Nadine is joining us now. Right. Okay. People on YouTube, thank you very much. It's been a laugh. Um, send us some feedback if you can. And I'm now going.